episode 70 with Todd Martin. Welcome to Spot On Insurance. Join us each week as we speak to insurance professionals, attorneys, regulators, and compliance specialists on topics ranging from improving your agency to staying on the right side of the law. Subscribe and stay informed on the effects of new trends and disruptive emerging technologies on your businesses and your industry. Today, we are going to begin by giving thanks to our growing circle of professionals worldwide who have been listening every Tuesday on Spot On Insurance. To our listeners here in the U.S., we send our gratitude. For those of you who have been listening from Africa, thank you for joining our growing family. Singapore, ni hao. Shesheni de ling ting. Puerto Rico, gracias por su apoyo y por pasar su tiempo con nosotros aprendiendo más de nuestra industria de seguro. UK, welcome. Nice to have you aboard. In Germany, wie geht's? Und danke für zu hören. And now for our guest. Todd Martin joined us for episode 54 where we gained an education on association health plans, how they are formed, and the fundamentals. Today he joins us to discuss recent changes in the laws and what they mean for you going forward. Todd is a partner at Stinson Leonard Street, one of the larger law firms serving clients across the United States in a wide range of practice areas, including corporate finance, intellectual property and technology, private business, product liability, and health law. Todd has over 20 years experience in insurance regulation, administrative law, and employee benefits. Currently, he advises insurers, third-party administrators, brokers, and employers on health plan regulatory concerns. Todd, welcome back to Spot on Insurance. Thanks for having me. How are you doing, Todd? Welcome. Doing great. Good deal. So we're going to be talking today about association health plans. But first, I wanted to talk about just insurance and employee benefits That is such a major concern for small businesses as well as sole proprietors. Rising health care costs is just an enormous part of budgets uh, around the country. I'm anxious to discuss with you the association health plans, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago on episode 54, but also on the new regulations that have taken place. So I know that on June 19th, 2018, the Department of Labor released the final association health plan regulations. Tell me, Todd, what are the intended purposes of these new regulations? So the the idea of these regulations is to allow small businesses to come together to create large employer plans in the same way that a, that a, a large business would be able to do that would be free from many of the requirements that the Affordable Care Act uh, and and state laws uh, apply to the individual and small group uh, insurance plans. And the idea really is to help these uh, small businesses be able to come together to uh, negotiate, to drive down costs for the businesses, and also to uh, increase the opportunities to uh, design the plans that would better fit the needs of those member businesses. I mean, we know that small businesses are the backbone of the economy. So if they have more money in their budgets and in their in their coffers, that allows them to expand, normally expand their businesses. So that's really good that this is taking place. How did prior to the ACA rules, how did it limit the association health plans? When the, when the, when the ACA came in, there, were, there was guidance originally issued that, that said that insurers had to look through an association, basically ignore it, uh, to decide what kind of, of insurance requirements would be uh, in place. And if there were any small employers in there, so, so employers with less than 50 employees, or if there were any individuals uh, in the plan and who weren't uh, employers, then the insurer would be required to comply with the small group insurance requirements uh, of the ACA, or if there's individuals in there, comply with the uh, individual uh, requirements. And so those small group and individual uh, requirements um, imposed uh, a number of of benefit mandates, um, so there, there was some standardization in the kind of coverage that had to be offered. That had to meet certain metal levels, the bronze or gold you know, requirements, and and would have to include all of the essential benefit uh, requirements. 
And then, uh, importantly, they were required to generally charge the same insurance premiums for any small employer or individual within a certain region. And so that meant that that um, associations really couldn't offer s- small employers or individuals who are members any different coverage options or pricing that was than was already available to them in this in the small group market. So there were some um, existing association plans that were grandfathered or grandmothered and and stayed in operation while those rules were in in place. And there were also exemptions in place for um, self-funded association plans. So how do the new regulations change these rules? So there's a couple pieces to it. So the, so the first one is that the Department of Labor is clarifying that those look-through rules don't apply if the, if the plan is issued to a, a bona fide association uh, as defined under uh, ERISA. Um, and then the second piece of it is it expands the scope of who can qualify as a bona fide association. And what type of association can sponsor a health plan under the new rules? So generally it has to be an an employer association of businesses that have a commonality of interest among the members. And so that that expansion that I mentioned of of what of who can qualify as a bona fide association is now going to also include working owners and sole proprietors. So under the old rules, if you didn't have actual employees working for you, if you were a working owner, then you wouldn't meet the definition of an employer and could not be uh, included within a bona fide association plan. And then the rules also um, expand the commonality of interest requirements. So the old rules said that it, that you have to be members of the same trade or industry or line of business. But the new rules now add a new category in that a regional uh, connections. So you can establish an association based on a state uh, or based on a metro area, even if that goes across state lines. And these are all things that uh, didn't happen before, right? They couldn't do it. Right, exactly. So, yep. So that expansion now into a regional-based association uh, is new. And then the other thing that's new is the old rules said that the primary purpose of the association could not be offering health care so the or, or health insurance the the you know association had to be established for other reasons and then could kind of incidentally as a as a small piece of that also offer uh, health insurance the new rule says that the association can be established for the purpose of offering health insurance as long as it also has some other purpose, not just offering health insurance. Wow. So those are some big uh, changes because that the fact that now just an owner, a small business owner that might just be the only employee of a company, that now they can be part of an association health plan. That's a big, big change that will affect many, many people. The fact that you can also get together just based on your region, not so much on your industry, that is a a big, big change. That is just significant. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of expansion here that a lot more individuals will be able to participate in association health plans. Yeah, if you think about, you know, employer associations, like, for example, in in, an agricultural-based cooperative or, you know, association, that they're going to have a mix of members within them. So there's going to be large farms that have many employees, and then there's also the, the... mom and pop farms where there's just the working owner and, the, and their families. This expansion would allow the association to cover both of those groups. And Todd, are there requirements on how the association operates? Uh, yeah. So one of the fundamental issues is that it cannot be controlled by uh, a health insurance issuer. It has to be controlled, at least to some degree, by the employer members of that. So they have to have the rights to hire the leadership and to establish the plan and so on, independent of the health insurance issuer. If it's regional, how do I form this group? I'm thinking about the directors of the association. How do you put this together? So there's a couple different ways to do it. So one is an existing association may decide to do it. Say, for example, in an existing chamber of commerce or an existing employer occupational based group. So like the association of bank, uh, bankers or something like that may may come together through that existing association and then, and then issue um, the plan then as a part of that 
uh, existing you know, organization. So the, the membership uh, votes in and elects that board, and that's how it operates from then on, right? Right. So that so that would be kind of using the existing structure of the you know of the organization. And one other thing that's in the rules is if the association has already existed before the rules were enacted, it's presumed to have a purpose other than providing health insurance. So the so the other option is to create a new association, and that and that could be done in a couple different ways. So one might be an existing association may look to kind of expand its membership and kind of create a new part of itself that's that's maybe a little broader than it than it had been you know before so so it might create a new association entity that would be the connector you know, for those employers who are going to be in the health plan or you could have a brand new association that starts up that wasn't uh, in place before so maybe a, a group of businesses in a region you know, decide, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, form a, a business coalition here. It's going to be new and it's going to, you know, offer health options. And it's also going to do other things, at least some other things. It can't just offer offer health insurance. Okay. Now, can the association health plan charge different rates based on experience factors for employer members? No, and this or generally not. So the, uh, and this is an a difference between the new rules and the old rules. So, so the new rules say that that you can't charge different employers uh, different amounts based on their health experience or their 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 underwriting uh, factors. Um, you can have divisions that are not based on health factors. For example, you know different uh, job categories or different locations. You know, one of the examples in the and the regulation was that um, an agricultural uh, association could have a different plan and different rates for dairy farmers than they have for um, for corn growers. Um, but within that group, whatever group that is that you define, they have to be you know, treated the same and can't be charged different rates based on health fact. Okay, Todd, and you talked about that you could actually start up a new association health plans, but are there pros and cons to starting a new one versus keeping the old one? One of the things that the regulations did, which is new in the in the final regulations that wasn't included in the proposed regulations, is to say that the old rules still apply, and this is just a new way to structure a, a health plan. And so, so to the extent that there's an existing you know association that that already has an association health plan operating based on the old rules that wouldn't include um, sole proprietors, for example. They can continue to operate under the old rules, or they could decide to expand their membership and operate under the new rules. And if they're operating under the old rules, then they don't have to comply with the uh, requirements that you that you can't make different rates you know, based on on underwriting and uh, experience. And do state laws still apply to association health plans? So this is a really important piece of this. So yes, they do. Um, and the regulations made it very clear that the federal law is not going to you know, preempt state law. And so state laws can still you know, regulate these. And so, um, so prior to the ACA, there really wasn't a lot of you know, federal restrictions on, on association health plans, but there were big, big differences kind of state to state on how they treated association health plans. So the um, association health plan is insured, then that insurance is still going to be regulated by state law. And if the association plan is self-funded, that would qualify as a self-funded multiple employer welfare uh, arrangement. And those plans are not preempted by ERISA and they are subject to state law. Okay. So how do states regulate association health plans? So there's there's a big variation in state laws. And so some states are, are very uh, receptive to association uh, health plans, and some of them are very uh, restrictive. So for example, some state laws have a, a look-through requirement like the old uh, ACA rule that would say if you've got a small employer in your plan or if you have an individual in your plan, then those are going to then then your plan is going to be subject to the state law, small employer or, or individual requirements. And then other states 
would allow the uh, insurer to treat qualifying association plan as a large group plan and not uh, subject to the small group or uh, individual uh, health plan requirements. And then there, there, are, there are also state variations as it relates to self-funded health plans. So some states say um, associations cannot sponsor a self-funded health plan at all. Then other states say they can do it, but they have to meet a variety of requirements to get approval you know, by the state. There may be some uh, filing requirements and some you know, ongoing reporting requirements so that they can demonstrate that they're viable and solvent. Spot On is sponsored by Insurance Licensing Services of America. Need help with corporate name changes, annual returns or surplus lines tax filings? Feeling overwhelmed? If you're looking for experts in regulatory compliance, you've come to the right place. ILSA provides the industry with over 50 services. To learn more about the company and how they can help, visit ilsainc.com. So it's actually a good thing that they expanded their rules so that you can join an association health plan based on region as opposed to just by industry, because if you're all over the United States, then you're still having to comply state by state with all of the regulations. So that is a very positive thing that it's been expanded to just be regional. Right. And you could have, say, a large national association that has certain plans that apply in certain states and other plans that, that apply in other states. But if you're looking to offer a plan, if you're you know, a large association of, that operates in, in multiple states and you're looking at offering you know, different health options you know, in those states, then you really have to go and look at the state law in that state to see whether they allow these kinds of plans at all uh, and if so, what, what restrictions would apply. And so there, there may be different plans that are offered then to different members in different states. So overall, do you expect um, the states to come out in support of the expansion of the association health plans? So I think we're going to have a mix. Some states are going to be you know, very supportive of the, this idea, and they may be looking at their state laws if there are, are restrictions to loosen those to encourage these, these kinds of plans. And then there are other states who we would expect to uh, not be in favor of these kinds of plans. And so we've already seen the attorney generals of the states of New York and Massachusetts say that they're going to do the administration to try and block the new rule. Oh, wow. So what is the concern from those groups opposed to the expansion of association health plans? What's the argument? So there's a, there's a few concerns. So one of them is that the expansions of these, these plans uh, for the small employers and working owners are going to uh, shrink consumer protection. So there are all these mandates that were built into the into the ACA that that applied to small group and individual uh, insurance, and and those would be relaxed, you know, for this. And then there's also some risk that there that there could be fraud or or mismanagement in this in these kinds of plans. Back in the in the 80s and 90s, there were you know a number of of association plans that were that were formed with unscrupulous individuals who, you know, who didn't manage the, the plans in the, you know, in the best interest of, um, of the members. Uh-huh. But, but, but I think the big issue is concern that having small employers getting pulled out of the small employer market or, or in the individual market would harm the small employer and individual markets in the states and then drive up costs for those individuals and small uh, employers who are still buying coverage in those markets. Can I uh, get you to take a stand and say, what do you think specifically? I mean, you're telling us the laws and the changes. Is this more helpful in your opinion or more harmful at this point? It depends on what lens you're looking at it from. So if you look at it in a, from the lens of the small employer, I think there's there's new options available and, and new options for you know, um, associations to really help their members, you know, find coverage options. If you're looking at it from the lens of the, you know, health insurance markets in a state, there are um, issues with the viability of those those markets and the costs uh, going forward. But I don't expect this to be a massive shift because there's there's a whole lot of other things that have to go into an association being able to sponsor a health plan. So. I don't expect 
a giant move from the small group, you know, market into uh, association health plans. You know, but I think for those associations that do have the ability to offer this kind of thing to their members and and have the right circumstances, I think they can really offer uh, consider sa- savings for their for their members. Okay, so we first talked about this subject, association health plans, back in March. The new rulings took place uh, June 19th. When do the actual changes take effect? So for fully insured association health plans, the new regulations will be effective as of September 1st of 2018. For existing self-funded association plans, the rules will be effective as of January 1st of 2019. And then for brand new self-funded association health plans, the effective date will be April 1st of 2019. So what should associations do to consider whether these changes may be valuable to their members? Uh, One thing that associations can expect is that their members are going to be asking about it because obviously there's this um, association health plan. These rules have been in the news. And so one thing that existing associations should be doing is considering whether or not this may be an option for them and, and for their members. And so there's a few steps that associations should go through to consider whether this may actually be um, a viable option for them and and for their members. So the first one is to consider whether or not they can be structured to meet the requirements of a bona fide association. So those are expanded now, but they still have to, you know, meet one of those those categories. The second piece of the analysis is really to look at, you know, where are they located? Um, what states are they in? What states are their are their members in? And then looking at the, you know, receptiveness of state laws in those states to an association health plan. They may be in some states that are that are very open to that and they may be in other states that are that are not open at all to that kind of program. The last piece is to really look at the dynamics of the association. Are there some ways that if they bring their members together that they could uh, lower cost or or design a you know health insurance plan that would be better fitting their needs. And so where are their members located? Do they have some critical mass where they can bring together larger numbers and then really then evaluate what does a health plan look like for our members. For an association that's looking to evaluate their options, uh, how can you help them? Sure. So we can help them understand what these rules are and then look at the state laws that they're going to be looking at and then you know help them connect with others, whether it be brokers or actuaries, to help them look at um, evaluating whether an association plan may work for them. For our circle of insurance professionals that need your help or might want to take you up on this, how do they get in touch with you? My email is todd.martin at stinson.com. And my direct phone line is uh, 612-335-1409. Guys, make sure you push that subscribe button so you don't miss episode 71 entitled Today's Innovative Underwriter. That's next week when we will be interviewing Mike Gula. Mike has been an underwriter for some major players, including Nationwide, Insurance, an all-state company, and now is the director of underwriting for Hippo. Join us as we discuss underwriting analytics, artificial intelligence, AI, Internet of Things, IoT, and predictive learning for underwriting. We also talk about Hippo's fresh approaches to the home insurance market. The company says it's set to disrupt an outdated industry by providing home insurance that is fast. How fast are? 60 to 90 seconds, and it's also simple to purchase online. That's next week on Episode 71. Todd. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today to talk about association health plans. We look forward to having you on another episode in the future. Thank you again. Great. Thank you. Visit spotoninsurance.com where you'll discover an ever-growing library of podcasts, videos, articles, and online tools by professionals for professionals to enhance your insurance education. By the way, that's where you'll also find our podcast notes and bonus resources. Please don't forget to click the iTunes link to rate and review and let others know what you think of Spot On Insurance. Thank you for joining us and we'll catch you next week.